Well, hello everybody. Um, I'm Kao Alexandre Jaja. I'm an AI software developer manager at Bentley Systems, um, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about one of our machine learning um, infused product, P92 iTwin. So, the title of this session is Accelerating the Digitization of 2D Design Data Using Machine Learning. And it's really what we're going to show you. Um, so I've been working with Bentley for um, over three years now to um, add machine learning in many of Bentley's different products across all of the infrastructure lifecycle. And one place where machine learning can really do a difference is when we are trying to um, extract information out of dumb data, whether it's a raster um, drawing, um, a legacy document that has been scanned, or whether it's just um, data where um, some of the metadata has been lost in the transformation process. So really, um, everybody's excited about um, digital twins, i-twins, but sometimes the barrier of entry is just um, too high to, uh, to achieve something. Because um, if you're thinking of a plant that's been built in the 60s or 70s, then you pretty much are um, sure that you don't have access to um, digital documents. Um, what you have is probably a bunch of, of drawings, but in paper format, or maybe if you're lucky, they've been scanned with a, with a good quality of scan. But to get access to the information that is in those documents, you really need to do um, a very lengthy manual process of recreating these drawings or extracting the information. And that's one place where machine learning can really be put to use. And we've developed at Bentley a solution that allows you to take um, drawings, in this case specifically PNID drawings, process and instrumentation diagram, which is really a, a ubiquitous type of drawing. Uh, for a plant, we can have hundreds or even thousands of those drawings. And they describe um, the process that uh, is happening with fluids, um, gases, uh, anything that has um, to do with the process line or um, with just bringing water in the building. Um, actually, I will also have one of my colleagues, Justin Doherty, who will show you how you can really um, use this, um, this machine learning solution by accessing our APIs directly. So first, I'll just give a quick overview of the solution that we're talking about today. Then we'll go ahead and dive in with a demonstration of the tool. Um, we'll, we'll use it on a, on a drawing that I've um, snatched up uh, from the internet, and we'll see how we can uh, also review the results that the machine learning model is, is providing. And then um, we'll show you how you can use that tool yourself and um, integrate it in your, in your workflows to make them more smart. And finally, we'll just um, have a small conclusion where we'll also show you where you can learn more about this. So let's get started with an overview. So um, p to i it's really a machine learning pipeline. So it's actually a combination of multiple different machine learning models um, that are put to use to extract data out of um, raster p drawings. And I mean, it can be applied to PDF sheets, um, to PNGs, scans, uh, JPEGs, BMPs, whatever. If you have an image format, it will work. And um, why are we doing this? Like, I, I explained it a little bit during the introduction, but it's really because um, a lot of companies are interested in getting those, uh, those i-twins, but they, do, they just don't have any um, digital information available. So we have to go where the information is. And if it's, in, if it's in the form of paper drawings, then that's where machine learning can really help us because it can extract both the text information that's present on the drawings, but also the symbology, the, um, the connectivity between the different equipment that are present on the sheet. So yeah, this is really what um, the solution is about. So it, it can detect um, equipments on the drawing. It can also detect unique tags for these equipment and associate the tags with the right equipments. So that this allows you to create a registry of all your, uh, your tagged elements on your drawing. And finally, um, you, if you are willing to put a little bit more effort and really review the results that the machine learning process is giving you, this can also be the start of a recreation process. So if you're thinking of um, updating a plant, you have some changes to do on a process line, and you'd like to have an up-to-date drawing, if you only have a scan document, then you have to recreate the whole drawing. But with machine learning, you can start from um, everything that the, the machine learning algorithm has been able to extract, and then you simply have to add a couple of changes and make sure that you re review what the machine learning process has, has given you, because it's not going to be 100% accurate, of course. So that's it. Um, let's dive in with a demonstration of the tool. And um, I've actually uh, 
went on, I've, I've been surfing the web and I managed to find this old PNID drawing. It's actually from the NRC, the Nuclear um, Regulatory Commission. So they have a bunch of openly, uh, open access um, drawings from old plants. I think this one, uh, some of the sheets, they date back to the 70s, like you can see here. It's, uh, and this is actually a hand-drawn um, PNID. You can see the symbols were hand-drawn, the text was hand-drawn. And uh, actually our solution works, um, it works fine on, on hand drawings. Of course, sometimes the OCR is not as accurate, the uh, OCR, the text, recognition part. OCR is optical character recognition. So of course it's not as accurate on hand-drawn characters, but it's actually doing a pretty good job. And here, actually what I what I got was a, a multi-page PDF. And some of the pages are more recent than other, like here it's a it's a vector drawing. Um, I, I mean it was scanned, but it, you can see it's not hand-drawn. But some of the pages are hand-drawn, others um, other are, are, and some can be pretty pretty messy, pretty dense here. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. So what I did is I uploaded this um, drawing and I actually already ran, um, I actually already ran the, ma the machine learning algorithm on, on it because it could take around 20 minutes to do it. But um, if I hadn't done so, um, what we can do is just like, for example, here I have another sheet. This one's just a PNG of a simple PNID drawing. So you can just um, add the, the, the image, you just drag and drop it. Let's get started, and you j the, the file just gets uploaded on the SAS, and um, then you can just select it to run an analysis, and it will kickstart um, a node in the cloud so that it launches the machine learning pipeline on this drawing. And maybe at the end of the, the, um, the session, we can see um, if the result's actually completed for this. But what I'm going to do is actually go ahead and um, review um, the result for this file. So I can click View Analysis here and look at um, everything that's been uh, extracted. And actually, the machine learning algorithm was able to extract over 9,000 um, objects from those sheets. And we can also see a breakdown of um, the objects that were extracted per sheet. So actually, we, yeah, we have 35 sheets in this drawing. But this is machine learning, and machine learning, it learns from examples. So the model that uh, we are um, giving you access to today, it's actually been trained on hundreds of PNIDs from different clients who use different symbologies. So across time, there were different standards. Sometimes there weren't really any standards at all. A lot of different companies were using different symbols depending on where in the world they're located or, or whatever. So we have a machine learning model that's learned to recognize what a valve or what a pump looks like, no matter what the symbology is. And um, this is pretty accurate, but it's not 100% accurate, and especially for, for rare um, elements, like some vessels that will look very peculiar. Maybe they are actually unique. So the machine learning model is going to be a lot less accurate when it hasn't seen a lot of examples of something. So it's really important if you want to have accurate um, representation of your information to go back and then review the predictions that the model has made. And actually we use this as feedback. So the model is continuously learning from what the users are giving us uh, as feedback. And if they're correcting something, then we can expect the model to get better and to learn from those mistakes and to, to be making less and less mistake over time and be more and more accurate. So I'll just click here and hit review process and we'll open just the first sheet um, for review here. So the first thing that you'll see is you'll see those um, yellow bounding boxes for all the elements that have been detected. And we actually get a breakdown of the different classes that were detected. So all of these classes are standard um, classes that are part of a, of a standard schema. So it's easy to import them later in a digital twin or, or in an iTwin and to um, cross-reference whatever has been extracted here with, uh, with other with other sources of information. And wh what we can do is we can um, go ahead and pick any category here, and we'll see all of the elements that were part of this gate valve category. And actually, the model is not only detecting the symbols and, uh, and creating a bounding box around them, it's also trying to um, recuperate um, some unique tags for each of those symbols. So we can actually um, classify the object by tag, and then I can click on one of them and start reviewing it. So we can see here that it was able to grab this tag here, recognize the text that was um, written there, and um, associate that this tag number was actually belonging to this valve. 
So every time I review an object, I can either approve it if um, I think that the machine learning model has done a good job with it. I can ignore it if um, I'm simply not interested in that class of object, for example, or I can delete it if the model was actually wrong and um, shouldn't have detected anything there. So here, everything looks fine. I just want to go ahead and approve it. Here, um, you see we have another gate valve, but this time, if we look at the text, it looks like the model was actually confused instead of um, an 8. It actually seems more like a B to me. So we can go ahead and correct this and make sure that when we aggregate this data, the user um, label, the tag will align very well with other sources of information. And I mean, this is something that you'll see happen more often on hand drawn um, drawings or on, on drawings where the scan quality is a little bit less accurate but it's something that can happen. And what we usually do with this is that we can also um, provide a config file where for each class of object you can define a regular expression um, about what the tag should look like. So for example here, if we had known um, that the tag for a valve should be a letter, three numbers, and then maybe an additional letter, then we, we would have been able to correctly um, get this character and say, okay, this looked like an 8 to the OCR, but really it was a letter because it's supposed to be a letter here. And what's most likely is that the 8 was actually confused for a B, and we can put the B automatically. So that's something that we can do. But here I didn't, um, I didn't create any config file. Maybe there isn't one available, so we can still review this manually. Then I can approve it. And here we have a bunch of, of other valves. They don't have any um, user label. They're just generic valves, so we can directly approve them and we can see if there are maybe other other valves that we um, what might want to tweak the results for so yeah here okay this one is fine it's got the right tag another generic valve here yeah oh and here's an interesting mistake so actually here further there's a, a couple of mistakes here so first the model um, actually um, detected two of those valves together as just a single object so I might want to adjust the bounding box here, for example, to just center on this um, valve. And then it actually put together um, both of the tags together. So I just want to clear that and make sure that I have the right um, the right tag. And actually, it's, this one is not a gate valve, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a ball valve. So I can just go ahead, select the right class for this, and approve it. And what I will want to do is go back here, and I can directly go and add a new object for the other valve that wasn't detected. So I can go here, drag a bounding box, select ball valve again, and I can enter the right um, tag number, and that's it. So you see I'm making progress here on my review, and I have reviewed 24 elements out of the 316 that were detected on this sheet. And yeah, that's the way you can go and review um, all of the results. And sometimes what's uh, also um, Helpful is if you have some categories. For example, if you're looking at the reducers, um, usually they won't have any um, specific IDs or any tags. So you can go ahead and, and just um, look at um, the sheet. And oh, I see here that there's actually one that's wrong here. So this is not a pipe reducer. It's, it's um, a plug valve, actually. So I can just go ahead, enter this, and then click Approve, and this one here. Yeah, this, not, this is not the reducer, it's just the, it seems like the ref triangle here, it's got um, just a line that confused the model. And we can also see here, I, I have a confidence level for the model, so most of these mistakes, they will happen for elements that have low confidence. So for example here, I can go ahead and I will just delete this because this is actually not um, an equipment. And everything else, yeah, it looks like these are really um, reducers, so I can have a quick look around and um, I can select everything else and just bulk approve them and boom, I have approved 17 more elements. And yeah, that's just the way we would go ahead and review um, all of the equipments here. So, and if I want, I can do it for uh, the second sheet. So as we saw earlier, this one was not hand drawn. So it's actually, uh, there's probably a lot less mistake there to correct. And that's the way you go ahead. And when you're done, you just click done it will save any review changes that you've done and uh, yeah I can see a breakdown so I have 41 objects here that are approved and that are ready to be um, um, imported in other workflows and the way I can do it is I can simply um, select download all, download all here and it will download 
all of the information for my files, which I will then be able to um, access. So it's going to take a little while because there's 35, um, 35 files. So what I'm going to do is just um, pop it open here, Visual Studio Code, where I actually um, already um, downloaded the data for the first, um, the first sheet. So here, um, first you get uh, a JSON output. So um, this is the output that you're going to get. And there's just an asset section on the top where you will get some information about the file itself. So you'll get, um, yeah, so every time we run a, a PNID sheet, we also produce an output PNG, which will have uh, some specific dimension. And this is important because um, actually what we are doing is we are um, giving bounding boxes in terms of pixels. So it's important that you get the size of the raster image that we output. So if you want to overlay the bounding boxes on top of it, of course, it will, it will fit. And what's why do we provide also a PNG? Um, this is because when you have scanned drawings, sometimes they can have a little bit of a rot rotation in them. So as we correct that, the output can be a little bit different from the initial image. So if you provide a PDF that, was a, that had a little bit of rotation in it, we really want you to use the output PNG um, to display the bounding boxes. Otherwise, they won't fit. And that's something, I mean, uh, the machine learning model performs better when the image are, are aligned. So that's something that we um, do automatically as a matter of just pre-processing the file. Um, yeah, so after that, you'll get the region section of the JSON, where for each um, object, you'll get um, a bounding box with coordinates for the top left corner and height and width of the bounding box. And then you will get a number of, of interesting fields. So the user label is the tag for the object. Um, you will get a confidence level for the model. So for example, here the model is reconfidence uh, in, in what this object is. And then you'll get um, um, a class for the object as well. So here, this is a, a ball valve here. So I, can, I could import this. It's a ball valve that doesn't have any user label, but I can, uh, I can say that there's a ball valve here. And finally, you also have a status. So this one, it's not been reviewed yet. But if uh, we had re reviewed the object then here, you would see either approved, deleted, or ignored as the status for the object. So there's a, a couple of different workflows that you can do with this. Of course, you can just have um, your registry. You can count the number of ball valves that you have in your drawing. Or something that you can do is link this with other sources of information. So for example, if you, are, if you have a, a field engineer that's looking at a process line and there's a leaky valve, for example, and can note directly what the tag number is on the valve, and he wants to bring up the right drawing to know, okay, what's, what's the fluid that's running through that pipe? Where, what's gonna, what, what is it going to affect if I have to do um, changes on that line to, to replace that valve? Then he can directly query for that valve tag, and if you have um, extracted the information, then you can easily um, query for the tag number because you will have it in this output JSON automatically. So that's pretty much it. So we have a section for our regions. Um, we're also, uh, we also have sections for the links, the pipes that um, link um, the regions themselves. So we can establish relationship also between objects and say, okay, this valve is feeding this pump on this process line, for example. Yeah, so that's about it. Now um, I will uh, hand the microphone to my colleague, Justin, so that he can show you how um, you can access this machine learning model from our APIs. Hey guys, my name is Justin Dardy. I'm a software engineer here at Bentley with the iTwin platform. And one of my main responsibilities is working very closely with Carl and the Applied AI team in general and helping them to take the ML models uh, that they've created and trained and um, sometimes even the prototypes and helping them take those and put them into web applications and making them available. Um, through something we call the ML REST service. So in this diagram I have up on the screen, and this is just a short refresher of the overall schematic, um, you can see that we have our Gen 2 Azure storage as well as ML REST service, which we've developed. Basically, ML REST service is a collection of very powerful endpoints that allow you to do a lot of things related to machine learning. Um, anything from reading and writing your data um, to creating snapshots of your data, even um, kicking off entire ML pipelines, you can all do that through this collection of endpoints. So it's a very powerful service um, that can really spice up a lot of the web apps that are being developed out there. 
Um, now, in order to keep this compatible um, with all the different types of web apps and different data types uh, that you're dealing with, because machine learning can entail a lot of different data types, um, we have a level of indirection here known as ML Core. And ML Core is basically this TypeScript interface that interfaces with a lot of these web apps, such as the one that Carl just showed you, the PNID workflow that he uh, went through manually just now. Um, also, if you're dealing with 3D I models, um, the ML labeling tool is an example of uh, an, a custom in-house annotation tool that we've built. And just like the PNID workflow that Carl just showed, it interfaces um, through ML Core um, and it is able to access the underlying ML REST service endpoints. Now, for the purposes of the PNID workflow, I won't be going through all of the endpoints, but I do want to point out that we do have pretty good documentation written up on how to set up that entire workflow and how to go about um, using all of the endpoints. But I do want to single out five endpoints in particular that I feel are pretty essential to this overall process of bootstrapping you and getting you off the ground running here with batch processing your data. So if you think back to the uh, PNID drawings that Carl just showed you, um, it was a very large PDF with hundreds of pages, each with hundreds, if not thousands of symbols. And the PNID um, workflow involved him manually uploading that one PDF file. Now, the power of the ML um, pipeline is that you could basically batch process these in, in a scripted way um, by interfacing directly with um, the API. So I'm going to be going through um, these five endpoints that I feel like are uh, pretty essential to the overall process here. And uh, some things I am taking for granted, um, just the authentication step in general, um, also the PNID drawings themselves, I'm just reusing exactly what Carl just showed you. Um, so that's kind of um, goes without being saying, you're going to have to have data to be annotated. Um, and of course, just creating and configuring a completely blank slate project. So nothing else in there um, with, uh, with the project other than uh, you've just created an ID. Um, also, uh, probably with the proper scopes, um, that is also important. But all of that is included in the documentation on that link that Carl shared. Um, and I will be, for purposes of this demo, jumping directly into the uh, create inference uh, endpoint. So let me switch on over to the create inference endpoint. So I'm going to be starting over as from scratch as much as possible here. Um, and really, all you need to get started is that project ID. So if you go to that screen that Carl was on earlier, and you pull out this specific um, GUID here, that is your project ID, this will allow you to retrieve a inference ID, which at that point, you are using pretty much for the rest of these endpoints. Um, so this is really the only time you even need the project ID just to um, instantiate uh, kind of your workspace here, um, which we are calling the inference um, workflow inference uh, ID. So for the body, um, the only thing that needs to be changed here is the model version. And the model version you can think of as the current best model there is. Um, right now, I think 1.2 is actually the only option. I don't think 1.1 is even available anymore, but 1.2 is the current champion model. So it, in theory, is the, is the best at identifying symbols um, in the PNID document that I will be uploading. For project ID, Oh, sorry, I put this in the wrong spot. So first I need to authorize myself. Um, at that point, I need to put the project ID in the body, um, not the headers. There we go, now this makes a lot more sense. So that should be good now. Um, and again, um, authorization that's just tied to my Bentley account. So all I had to do was select authorization code and we're good to go there. It sets up the HTTP request for me and I should just be able to hit execute. Hopefully it works. Yep, it looks like it worked. So we have successfully created our inference ID, which we will then use for our other endpoints. So once we have established our, our workspace here, the blank workspace for the inference job that we're going to be doing, we at this point need to actually upload the data. So Carl did that by dragging and dropping it into the interface, but you can do it programmatically as well. We'll be doing here. So let me start over as much as I can. So I'm simply going to this upload inference input content. Um, endpoint. 
So this one is a little bit more complex. You have to provide the um, authorization, of course, in the beginning, but then use the inference ID that we just created in the last step. So I need to copy this and put that there. Now for the content disposition, I have a um, specific formatting. And again, this is written in the guide, but to save time, I have it here on my clipboard buffer. Um, I'm just going to call it this. Um, this can be any file name, essentially. Um, really, this is just the name. It's to upload the actual binary, you have to select it. So I'm going to select it here. I have it saved locally. You could also just enter in the URI right here and it will pull it down um, from the internet for you, uh, download it, and then um, attach it as a binary. So I think that should be good now. Let me just change the file name uh, to something more meaningful, which is the actual PDF document. Let me just proofread it. Everything looks okay. That should be the right inference ID and binary is attached. Yeah, so let me try executing this. Hopefully it will work. Oh, yep, there we go. So we got a 200 okay. And if you glance down here, um, it shows you that it has now created a file name of the, the one that I gave it with the um, correct size. So we have our data up there. We have our inference workspace. Um, we're pretty much ready just to let it go at it. Um, so all we need to do now is to create the actual inference run. So let me again start over. So just go to this endpoint and click try it out again. Make sure to authorize yourself and then provide the inference ID. So I think it was that good. A lot of GUIs in my clipboard buffer now, so it's kind of getting confusing. But yeah, I think it's the 7.8 GUI should be the most recent one. And actually, that's it. Um, everything um, it needs is just the inference ID. So I think I should be able to hit execute here. And it looks like it successfully created this job. So if you look down in this response, you can see uh, the preliminary status, of course, is in progress. Now, this is a very big PDF uh, with a lot of pages and a lot of symbols per page. So it will take it a little while to get through that. Um, so to save time here, I have uh, done my own run ahead of time um, just to show you what the response would look like, like a real real life response. So um, this is how, oh, I guess before that, if you do want to check up on it, you just simply ping this endpoint. So pop in your inference ID and um, it will just tell you uh, basically if it's still in progress or um, if it's finished or any of the other states that that's that are are possible while you're waiting so this is the past run that i did earlier this morning um, if you scroll down you can see that it um, created the json uh, or actually a lot of JSONs for the different pages of the PDF file. And those will be of a um, identical format to the format that Carl was stepping you through earlier in his segment. And really that's it. You, it was that easy. Um, you pretty much just went through and let your ML model um, identify all of the symbols in that entire PDF. And now all it needs is a human eye to audit it. So I think that is just about it. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out. The documentation uh, that Carl shared in this link right here is um, absolutely uh, very helpful, um, especially if you are just trying to get set up and um, do like a proof of concept. Uh, and if you, if you have the data, um, really all you need to do is uh, hit that endpoint that I showed you where you upload it. And then you could uh, just use the API from there and the rest of the endpoints are really easy to set up. So I hope that was helpful. It's definitely uh, a very powerful tool to have in your arsenal. Um, and this is just one example of how to go about using your ML models um, through an API. Thank you, Justin. So um, this is Carl back for the conclusion of the session. So. Yeah, just in summary, what you learn is that machine learning can really speed up repetitive tasks. So recreating those drawings would have taken hours, if not days, um, to an engineer, but we can do it. We can do a review process in just um, a few tens of minutes. 
and then machine learning can really lower the bar of entry for iTunes creation. So even if you don't have any um, digitized information, you can reuse machine learning to extract that information and create your iTunes. And finally, Bentley is making available um, to ma the developers some of its machine learning model, especially when the workflows really make sense for, for a developer to integrate in, into their workflows and make them smart. Yeah, so that's about it. I'm uh, just leaving those links here. So if you want to go and try out this API, it's already available, and you can find more information about the portal or community support with those links. With that, I just want to thank you um, in my name and, of course, in the name of my colleague Justin. Uh, and if you have any questions, please reach out using our emails. We'll be more than happy to tell you more about this and about other um, machine learning offerings that Bentley currently has.